Let me give my word of welcome to everyone who is here this morning, especially as we've come to the conclusion today of the studies that we have been having with our young people and for our young people. Um, I said yesterday, but I want to say again, to our young people, thank you so much for being here the way you were. Thank you so much for your interest in spiritual things. To the parents, thank you for making sure your children came. Thank you for sending a message to them of what was important. And for those who were able to come, I think it was so important for our young people to see older people, uh, not so young people, of which I am one, there with them to know that they are not alone as they go through the journey. I know everyone couldn't make it yesterday or Friday night. I appreciate those of you who went out of your way to do so. I think it was a great study, had great lessons. And if you weren't able to make it, the lessons are online now on our Facebook page and on our, on our YouTube channel. So uh, check those out. The, the lessons, I, I, I cannot go on enough about what an incredible job Mark Roberts and Roger Schaus did yesterday in dealing with just important questions that young people are wrestling with. We're going to continue that this morning. <clears throat> he was probably around 17 years old, and he had dreams and aspirations just like all of you guys, like everybody else. He must have had plans about how his life would go, but all of that changed when an invading army came in. And suddenly, as a young man, he was taken to a foreign country. He was different in every way, ethnically, Ethically, religiously, 2,600 years ago, Daniel found himself in a very difficult situation. And he had to decide, decide if he was going to go along with everyone else and be like everyone else or if he was going to be different. Different. There are 7 billion people on this planet. And all of them are really different, right? Right? Every once in a while, we'll run, we'll run across someone and we'll say, you know, that person looks like someone else, right? You'll see someone, oh, they look just like that person. They don't look just like them. When I was a teenager, a couple of my friends and I were making this movie. It was a Superman parody. And so we were filming in downtown Columbus, Mississippi, which is just like the city of Metropolis, by the way. And uh, we were filming downtown, and we were filming right down from the movie theater. And I was Superman. Um, and so while we were filming, people were coming out of the movie theater watching us. So the next week we were going to the movie theater and I was getting my ticket and the guy goes, hey, you're that guy that was Superman last week, right? And I go, well, yes, I am. <laughs> he said, you look just like him. I think, well, yes, I do. <laughs> he said, but when you put on the suit, you get smaller. You see, we're all very different from one another, right? Even if there are similarities. You look at the human race in crowds, we're all very different. There are black people, there are white people, there are men, there are women. There are women who are blondes, there are women who are brunettes, there are brunettes who become blondes. <laughs> there are blondes who become brunettes. <laughs> there are tall people, there are short people, there are skinny people. There are large people. There are bald people. There are bald people. There you go. I was hoping you'd get that. <laughs> there are people who have hair who shave their head. I don't get that. <laughs> but we're all very different, aren't we? We all have two arms for the most part, two legs, a head, nose, eyes, mouth, ears. But we're all very different. But despite the fact that we are so very different, there is something about us that longs to be like everybody else, right? There is something deep inside that longs for conformity, not to be different, not to stand out, something that longs to fit in and not be alone. You may identify with what, what, what one blogger said by the name of Matt Moore. He said, I've always adapted to be accepted. In my early teens, I realized the quickest way to be embraced by my peers was to become like them. However, they talked, I talked. Whatever they drank or smoked, I drank and smoked. 
Whatever it is they did or liked, I did and grew to like. In typical follower fashion, I bowed down to the ways and interests of others in an attempt to earn their acceptance because their acceptance was what I craved most. Sometimes when I'm around unbelieving family or friends, I find myself not wanting to be perceived as too religious or too goody-two-shoes. Sometimes I'll have a drink, not because I want one, because I want to show people that I'm not bound by restrictions. In the deepest part of my being, I don't want to be friendly with the ways of this world. I want to live outwardly what I've experienced inwardly, Christ. But why do I still bend so easily? Why do I desire to be desirable in the eyes of people who are at war with the God who lives in me? Can you identify with that? I can. I can identify with that on two levels. As a guy who used to be a teenager, I remember how difficult it was to be different. I thought last night when Roger was telling about being in the car and the guy started passing the joint around uh, about... One time when I was with several friends right after graduation and we were down by the river, a lot of people were there and someone pulled out a six-pack and it became a very awkward situation for me because I knew either I would disappoint God and drink, I would disappoint God by lying about why I couldn't drink, or I'd have to be different. For some reason, that terrifies us. I understand that. So I know why young people are asking that question. Let me give you another perspective, another reason why I understand the power of this as a parent. I don't want my children to be. I know sometimes, guys, you think that your parents are trying to ruin your life. <laughs> We're not. What we mo want more than anything else is for our children to ha be happy and successful and to have friends and to enjoy life. And it's hard when you have to tell your child, you can't wear that. You can't go to this place. A dance is inappropriate for the Christian. Because you're getting close to someone of the opposite sex and their feelings and their desires. That's tough. The question, why must I be so different, is a real one. And it's one that everyone here has struggled with at some time or another, especially our young people. Why do I have to be so different? Why do I have to stand out? Why can't I just fit in? I want to give you three reasons this morning that I think really get to the heart of this, and I hope will convict you as you read through the Word of God and you go through this lesson that there are reasons why you need to be different. First of all, because different is important to God. God, our Creator, desires for us to be different. In James chapter 4, verse 4, James said this, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God lays down a line right there, guys. And that line is, you and I have to make a choice as to where we will stand in life. John put it like this, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Get that? No middle ground. One or the other. We either love God or we love the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the, lust, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world is passing away and the lust of it. That's why you and I have to make a choice. You can choose the winning side or the losing side. John says the world, that's going to pass away. You choose God. And Peter put it like this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. Beloved, and I love this, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation there is an urgent call be different why God called you to be different and Daniel modeled different Roger pointed out to us last night Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 where we find Daniel 
purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies or with the wine which he drank. Daniel made a decision. And it was difficult for him, I'm sure. I don't know why he made this decision. Maybe the king's delicacies were unclean, and as a Jew, he wanted to make sure that he didn't eat something that was unclean. Maybe he just didn't want to be too much like the Babylonians, but he made a choice. And it was going to be hard to honor that choice. Part of his duty and responsibility was to make sure that he was always presentable, and the idea was you need to eat all these foods so that you can be healthy looking. And Daniel said, no, I can't do that. Which brings up a really good question we need to ask right now, and that is, what does it mean to be different? I want you to understand, it doesn't mean that you're odd. There are a lot of odd people in the world. Google that. <laughs> Started to put up pictures, but then I, I realized that the point is not for us to laugh at people who are different, because some people are just different. But it is just to illustrate the fact that some people are just different. And sometimes that's okay, but that's not our goal. When I'm striving to be different as a Christian, it's not I just want to stand out so that people think that I'm different. That's not the goal. It is also not to be different so you can draw attention to yourself. Some people like to be different so that everyone notices them. They become the center of attention. That's not what we're dealing with here. What does it mean to be different? The text that Brevin read to us just a moment ago in 1 Peter chapter 1 really nails down what different means. Different means to be holy. The very definition of the word holy, to be set apart, is speaking of the idea of being different. It is to say, I want to be holy, as we sang a moment ago, to the Lord. And so Peter just sort of ticks off several things that go into being different. He says that we're to be different in the way that we think. We gird up the loins of our mind. We pull everything together and start thinking about right things. He said it is to be holy in our conduct, different in our conduct, different in our love for other people, pure, sincere, fervent. And even in chapter 2, verse 1, different in the way that we speak. You want to ask yourself, how different am I? You compare yourself with that list, and that will give us a pretty good understanding of how different we are. The, way, the only way you and I will ever be different in our life is if we have an image of what it means to be different and we want to be different. And not only do we want to be different, we desire to be different. You got that? The only way we will be different is if we, like Daniel, purpose in our heart. You will never accidentally be holy. You will only be holy when you have turned to God and you have made a decision to be holy. Why? Because it's important to God. God wants you to be different. There can be no greater motivator in life as to why you and I need to think about this issue. Why is it so important for me to be different? God needs us to be different. And when I'm striving to be different, I'm striving to be different because the only one I'm trying to please is God. Boy, that's a hard lesson to learn. We are so fixed on pleasing everybody else, right? I want to make sure this person at school likes me and this person at school likes me. And if I like this person and they like me, then my stock really goes up. And we're so concerned about what do they think about me and what are they saying about me. We're just angst about those things. Instead of recognizing that the, at the end of the day, the only person whose view of you matters is God's. Psalm 118, verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Yeah, but if I live this way, I'm going to be so different. Everyone's going to be against me. If God's on your side, it doesn't matter. And Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't be dismayed if people speak about you. Don't be dismayed if people, dismayed if people don't like you. If God is on your side, I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is there for those who are holy. He is there for those who are different. You want to know why it's so important to be different? It's important to God. 
That's where it begins. But it doesn't end there. Because as you look at the life of Daniel, you see that not only is different important to God, different is important to us as well. Because Daniel was different, people began to notice Daniel. And Daniel grew in favor with those people around him. Look again in Daniel chapter 1. Again, verse 8. Daniel 1, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Notice verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. That is crucial right there. Because Daniel was different. Providentially, did God just open the door? Maybe. But certainly by the fact that Daniel was devoted to God and he was living differently, the chief of the eunuchs began to notice him. And you can imagine a conversation where the chief of the eunuchs, they're all talking with one another and all the servants of the king and the chief of the eunuchs says, have you guys seen this guy, Daniel? Daniel, I think I've heard about it. Let me tell you what. I've been around this castle for a long time. I've seen a lot of people come and go. I haven't seen anyone like Daniel. If I tell Daniel to do something, he is on it. There are times I don't even have to tell him to do something. He's on it. He's never lied to me. He's never tried to manipulate me. Daniel is a different guy. Other people notice Daniel. Because that's the type of guy he was. And I love it in chapter 1. When Daniel is presented with this temptation and he, he resolves not to eat of the portion of the king's delicacies, I love the way he dealt with the chief of the eunuchs. In verse 12, he says, Please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. Daniel comes in and he's not argumentative. He's not difficult. He's not saying, there is no way we're going to eat this. We're going to revolt. He said, look, here's the situation I'm in. I can't do this. Will you work with me a little bit? And the eunuch did. And you need to realize the eunuch's neck was on the chopping block here. He was responsible for these guys being healthy. So he was taking a huge risk. Even letting Daniel and his friends eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days. Because if they started to look gone, that would reflect upon him. The only reason he stuck his neck out was because Daniel, because he was different, found favor with him. And here's the point. When you live a different life, people are going to notice that. When you are honest, when you're trustworthy, when you work hard, when you show up to work early, when you stay late, when you do things that they don't even tell you to do because they need to be done, when you always tell the truth, when you have integrity in your life, people are going to notice that. And that oftentimes will go well for you. It did for Daniel. And my point is, there is a personal benefit when you are a different person. People are going to see that. But not only did he benefit because others noticed him, most importantly, he benefited because God noticed him. Notice verse 17 of chapter 1. As for these four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. God blessed him. When you live a different life, a holy life, when you are purposed in your heart to follow God, regardless of what other people say or do, God notices that. And let me tell you, God uses people like that. There is no question that as you see Daniel being blessed by God, a lot of the blessings he gave God, Daniel were spiritual blessings. He has the ability to interpret dreams. They think, well, how does God bless me then? Well, not only does God bless people with spiritual things in New Testament times and Old Testament times too, but notice in Romans chapter 12, open your Bible there, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul here. 
Romans 12, 6 through 8, having then gifts differing according to the grace that was given us, let us use them. Let us use what? Gifts. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts and exhortation, he who gives and liber with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now that first one is a spiritual gift. The rest of them are normal things that God blesses people with the ability to do. And the point is that when you are different and you're living a holy life, God will use you. God wants you to be different. You and I need to be different. And finally, different is important to other people as well. Because what you see in the first six chapters of Daniel are people's lives that were changed because of this guy who was different. I mean, from chapter 1 on, you and I need to understand the, the truth that was said by D.L. Moody years ago. A holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. People, beloved, need us to shine. You know what the world needs? The world needs to see courage and conviction. Roger last night mentioned chapter 3, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What an incredible story that is of three young men who are willing to go into a fiery furnace and die an excruciating death because they were standing by their convictions. But where did they get that strength and courage? Chapter 1 of Daniel. Daniel is the one who speaks. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are present. But Daniel is the one who steps up. He speaks to the chief of the eunuchs. It seems like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach, and they all got together, and what are we going to do? Well, I can't eat this. I can't either. We have to eat it. We're servants here. What are we going to do? And Daniel goes, I'll take care of this. And Daniel pulled the chief of the eunuchs aside and said, let me talk to you for a little while. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were on the outside. They were watching. What did they see in Daniel? They saw courage and conviction. Is it any wonder then... In chapter 3, when courage and conviction was needed, they stepped up. Where did they get it from? I submit to you, they got it from Daniel. They saw him, and they gained courage and conviction. The question that comes up when you read chapter 3 was, where was Daniel? Why wasn't Daniel stepping up? The only idea I can come up with is Daniel was somehow away with some kind of business, and they were by themselves. They couldn't rely on Daniel, and they had to figure out whether they were going to be courageous and whether they were going to have conviction. Guess what? They did? Because of Daniel. That's where they got strength, courage, conviction. But not only Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as you come to chapter 6, the Persian king that Daniel served under, Darius. You remember this story, and I hate that we can't spend more time with these stories because they are so rich. But you remember the story. Governors and satraps came in because they didn't like Daniel. Why? He was different. They came into the king and they said, King, you know, people need to make sure that they don't pray to anyone else except you. And the king liked that idea, and he signed off on that because it's all a trap. And it's really in the, around verse 15 that they spring the trap because the king liked Daniel and suddenly realized he had signed Daniel's death warrant. Notice in verse 15, Then those men approached the king and said to the king, No, O king, it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. And what does the king do? He sends Daniel to the lions then and capitulates to them. He knew they trapped him. He knew they were wrong. He bowed down to them, and Daniel lives. What happens in verse 24? The king gave the command, and he brought these men who had accused Daniel. They cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives. The lions overpowered them and broke all the... Uh, their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. What happened? He acted then, didn't he? Shouldn't he have done that at the very beginning? I mean, he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den because the law could not be changed. But once he realized he'd been manipul manipulated, shouldn't he have said, okay, you guys are going in too? Maybe it was because of Daniel's conviction. He kept praying anyway. The king said, hmm, I need to do something about these. 
My point is this. Your courage and your conviction can have a huge impact on the people around you. Your friends that you go to school with every day, the people that you work with, when you are different, living a life of conviction, maybe, just maybe, they'll start learning something from you. They will not learn it from the world. You know what they're going to learn from the world? Have sex out of wedlock. Do whatever you want to do. Step on people. Hurt people. They need your example so that they can be different. They need my example. They need that. Not only do we see that the world needs courage and conviction, the world also needs wisdom. They need people who think differently. In chapter 2 and chapter 4, you remember the story when the king brought in wise people because he had the dream. He didn't understand what the dream was, this giant statue. And Daniel came in and he gave the king wisdom. In chapter 4, he has a dream of the great tree and Daniel has to step in again. The king had questions. Daniel stepped in with wisdom The world needs wisdom today. Where are they going to get it from? They're going to get it from Kim Kardashian? Really? Is that where the world's going to find real wisdom? That's where they're turning. Kanye West? There's some movie coming out soon called Bad Moms. I read this quote from um, one of the actresses in it. Of course, because she's an actress who's played a mom, she's an expert at being a mom, right? I mean, that's just the way it goes. So they asked her about her idea about parenting. Listen to this. She said, the message is that there are endless ways to do it. However your gut is telling you to do it, that's what's right. No. That's not right. I mean, on the scale of wrongness, that is off the charts. That is such stupid, and I know people don't like that word. I hate that word too, but that is stupid advice. Because it begins to suggest to people, whatever you think is right in raising children, that's right. It sounds funny at first. Let me tell you, this is serious stuff. That's the reason why there's a mom out there who's pregnant. She starts smoking a joint, and she hurts her child because she thought it was the right thing to do. It's stupid. That's the reason some guy gets mad at his child because the child won't stop crying and he shakes it and damages the child's brain or kills the child because he thought it was the right thing to do. It is not the right thing to do. The world will never tell you the right thing to do. How in the world will the world ever find out what the right thing to do in any circumstance is? We are the only Bible the sinful world will read. The world needs wisdom from you guys. The world needs wisdom from people who are going to step in and say, let me talk to you for a few minutes about the Bible. I know it's an old book, but but listen to this. The world needs wisdom on how to worship God, as Mark talked about yesterday. The world needs wisdom on how to become a child of God. The world needs solid, grounded godly wisdom and the world needs people are going to say look you need to think about what you're doing here i love you and i care about you can we talk for a little while the world needs that the world needs for you to be different and finally the world also needs a sense of truth and they're not going to get it from the world in daniel chapter 5 the last babylonian king before the empire failed had a huge party And while he was at this party, a finger appeared and began to write on the wall. And no one knew what that said. They called Daniel in. And Daniel knew exactly what it said. Now, how would you have liked to have been Daniel when you walk in and you see up on the wall wall, three words, many, many, tekel, yusufarim. And he understands the meaning of these words. Verse 26, many. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. That's repeated two times for emphasis. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. You think that's a popular message to give the king? And Daniel knows exactly what it says. No one else does. How tempting do you think it would have been for Daniel to go, Ah, it means live long and prosper. (laughs) You are gold, king. Everything's going to be great for you. But that wasn't the message the king needed, was it? 
What the king needed was the truth. And so he told him the truth. And that night the kingdom fell. It's hard to be in the position where you tell people things they don't want to hear. But the world needs that. When your friend is coming up and they're thinking, they're saying, you know what, I, I think this is the one. And what do you think this is the one? Uh, we're going to sleep together this weekend. I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. What are you going to do? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to say, um, that's wrong. The Bible calls that fornication. And if you do that, you're sinning before God. Sex is okay, but sex takes place when there's a ring and a date and there are vows that have been exchanged with one another. Then sex takes place. You do that beforehand. You're going to mess your life up royally. You're going to sin before the Lord. You may find yourself pregnant. You may find yourself with a child. You may find yourself with a sexual disease. You may find yourself feeling horrible about yourself, dirty, and you've got to live with that. People need to hear the truth. People need to hear the truth about drunkenness. Friends are going, hey, we're getting drunk. You need to tell them, hey, the Bible tells us that's a sin. What's such a big deal about that? Well, you lose control of yourself and you're not acting as a light to the world. God said, don't do that. You want to do that? That's your business. But it's wrong. Ain't nothing wrong with drinking. Yeah, there is. You've gotten get drunk. Destroy your life with that. you sin sinned against God. You're going down the wrong road. They're not going to hear that from their friends, Right? What if their worldly friends are going to say, hey, you know, they're going to say, hey, what time? <laughs> what type of beer are you going to have? I'm there. They need someone different. And especially on the issue of homosexuality, transgender, all the stuff coming in, I'll, I will guarantee you, guys, they will not hear what the Word of God says from the world. What they will hear from the world is you do whatever you want to do. You're born that way. Live any way you want to live. I know that we have to live around a lot of people, beloved. I know we can't go around judging people. God's the one who judges, and we've got to love everybody. But we still have a duty and obligation to make sure that we take the time for people that we care about to teach them the truth. To open up our Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, and say the word of God says that is wrong. We can't make people do anything, but we can stand for truth. The world needs that. So I hope you see that when we ask this question, why do I have to be so different, there are some really, really important answers. They're not complicated. God wants you to be different. You and I need to be different. And the world, importantly, needs us to be different. The world needs lighthouse. And that's what we're called to be. I wish I could tell you that every time I was faced with the opportunity to be different, I was different. I will tell you this. You'll remember a lot of times in your life for the rest of your life when you were not different, when you should have been different. And there will forever be a twinge of guilt in the back of your mind of those times when you failed. That is inevitable. But the more you set your mind not to defile yourself with the world and even in some way to be a positive influence on the world, you will diminish those times. By God's grace, we trust when we come to him and when we ask him, we are forgiven. But let us follow the example of Daniel this morning, young or old. Let us purpose in our hearts this morning to be the people God wants us to be. Let us purpose in our hearts this morning to be people who are holy. Holy to the Lord. Bow our heads. Our gracious God and Father, hallowed be your name. Holy and separate are you. And by your grace and by your mercy, you make us holy and separate as well. We pray, dear Father, for strength to be holy not only in what you have done for us, but in our lives, in the way that we think, in the way that we act, in the way that we love, in the way that we speak. It is such a challenge. Strengthen our young people. Strengthen them with resolve. That does not come from themselves, but comes from you. Resolve to be different. 
a resolve to be different so that they may benefit themselves, but perhaps in an evangelistic way, a resolve to be different so that they may help others come to know you. May all of us, every one of us here this morning, understand that this is what you call us to be. We have a choice to make. Help us to choose to be different. Be holy. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I want to take the time now for any who are not Christians to know that you are welcome at this point in just a moment as we stand and sing to come give your life to God. If you recognize that you have not been living the way you need to and you want to change that this morning, you're ready to make a commitment to the Lord and confess the name of Jesus Christ before others. You're ready to be baptized this morning. You can be baptized and all your sins will be washed away. For those of us who are Christian, if there's something else going on in your life and you need the prayers of the congregation, maybe it's in this issue and you understand you have just not been as different as you need to be. Follow the example of Daniel this morning and resolve to be a different person. If you want us to pray with you, we would love to pray with you. You're subject to the Lord's invitation. We invite you to come now while we stand and while we sing.